Welcome back. You can hit us up on the Twitter at the FF Dynasty. You can catch me at IMC Myers. You can catch Big Co at Dynasty Big Co. Uh, we just wrapped up a little Christian McCaffrey talk. Might have got a lot little, of Christian McCaffrey. A lot talk. of Christian McCaffrey talk. Might have got a little long winded, but just wanted to put ourselves out there and and talk it out like we like to do on this show. Well, I think that was pretty. It was deep, and and it was it was a lot of fantasy football talk down in there. There was it just kind of where you might go with your team and how you might set it up if you don't already have them. And there was a lot there. So we kind of dug in real deep. We dug, we dug our heels in. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, let's get into part two. <laughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about the Tennessee Titans and, and maybe some Derrick Henry and, and this offense and Deion Lewis. Yep. Um, and really what kind of spawned this conversation was that it felt like this time last year and all throughout the summer, you there was tons and tons of Derrick Henry by this guy, Derrick Henry's the man. Derrick Henry's so good. He's a beast. And it seems like right now when you really survey the landscape out there and and, and people are painting the pictures for where the value is and all that kind of stuff and, and which guys you want, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of people uh, cheerleading for Derrick Henry right now. I completely agree. Even Def- though maybe it doesn't reflect in the ADP so much, but it's just there's not, his name's not coming out of as many people's mouths this year. Oh, no doubt. I 100% agree. Um, and we'll look at a lot of some reasons for that here in a bit. But I think you're absolutely right there, Casey. With last year, this man had a, a band, a parade, guys walking behind him with the high step, you know. And like this year, he's just he's a forgotten man. And like you said, the dynasty startup ADP doesn't necessarily represent what we're saying here. But it doesn't take. I mean, just open your ears and open your eyes. And and like you said, the the Derrick Henry love last year was was basically kind of like the Christian McCaffrey love that we just right, talked about, right. and now it's not there. Well, I think a lot of this game for me is value-based and perceived value, mm-hmm. and that's where I, I... I'm not a big guy. I don't want to get in here. I don't, I, don't, I don't try to trash too many players because I think a lot of guys... It, there's plenty of talented players and they don't get their opportunity or they don't get in the right system. They butt heads with the coaches. Maybe they get a little injury prone. Like you may get on here and be like, these guys are never like, Oh, these guys are always like kind of saying this guy's good. They never say anybody's bad. Like you could be like, I don't want to come on here and be like, well, Marquise Lee sucks. What's he ever done? He's garbage. And it's like, well, Marquise Lee just never really had his chance. And he just got out here. He was hurt. And and, and he mapped your way to a really nice season. If you had him on your team, you wanted Marquise Lee in your lineup. He he isn't a bad player. It just just took him a couple of years to get where he needed to go. Spent two years on a training table. And and couldn't couldn't get healthy. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is maybe the perceived value is a little down on Derrick Henry. And maybe we want to jump on that. Maybe, maybe I don't know. How do you feel the same way? Well, just uh, you you brought up Marquise Lee into the conversation, and I've done my fair share of, of, of bringing people around and reminding them about how Jarek McKinnon fell off and just looking at some stuff for tonight. Last year at this time, in May 2017, Jarek McKinnon was ADP 260. So let's not say that people can't revive their careers and revive their fantasy stats and revive their fantasy Getting love right situation. Right. And, and not to say that any, you know, Derrick Henry hadn't fallen off the map or anything. His, if anything his ADP is exactly the way it was last year, but there is nobody beating the drum for him this year. Right. And there and, is no DeMarco Murray. There's nowhere to, no one to split kind of carries with him. Oh wait, there is exactly. It's Dion Lewis somewhat, yeah. but I want to get into a little bit of why I was kind of down on this Titans offense, but since doing a little digging and some research, I'm going to give you the reason why I think that I'm kind of going after Derrick Henry right now. Even though his ADP might be where it is, I think the perceived value around people is maybe down a little bit, especially with Deion well, Lewis coming in. It's like, oh, it's the same story. It's the same, you know, oh, he's almost there. Oh, somebody else is there. They must not trust this guy. This, I, I'm glad you set it up like that because I believe what we're about to look into is going to be really cool. And after this conversation, I think you might be able to walk around and kick some tires on existing teams and pick up Derrick Henry for cheap. Right. If somebody if you're draft, stu- yeah. if you're in a startup right now, Derrick Henry's not necessarily cheap. And when you're in a real room in a real startup this year, it'll be interesting to see if he slides off of that ADP now that you got some more rookies off the board and everything, the draft happened and all that fun stuff. I believe that the running backs, the only reason that Derrick Henry's ADP is as high as it is is because all the other running backs went early. And so yeah. he's still a pretty, he's still what, 38 or something like that in the ADP. Um, he, uh, so, 
Yeah, 38 in his May 18 ADP, and I believe that's RB17. Right. So basically half of the picks so far in the ADP in that draft, in all those drafts that average, that's half running back so far. Yeah. So – I, and so I believe what what we're saying. That's RB seventeen last year. There's no way he was RB seventeen. No. You know he's fallen back, but he hasn't fallen back in total ADP because all the RBs are pushed up. Yeah. So if you if you RB's start, back, baby. RB's back. So and so if you're looking at a startup, you're still going to spend a fourth round pick on him if you want him. But if you're looking at an existing league, I think the same value of somebody that's going to go in the mid third round or mid you know mid fourth round, I think you can get him. Uh, you probably will be able to get Derrick Henry cheaper than that. Right. So last year and previous seasons, you had heard the exotic Smash Mouth and Malarkey and. All that kind of deal. Well, well, that ship has sailed. That he he's out of here. They had a nice they had a nice run, I guess. But Titans oh, they, fans, they had a really good 2016. Right. Demarco Murray was the exotic Smash Mouth right. in 2016. Demarco Murray's 2016 stats. I dare you to go look at them because they oh, will scare you. Oh, they're fantastic. They were filthy. He was a he was your definitely carrying you to a playoff. Filthy. Um, but so th- let's cue the new Titans regime and a fresh start. All that kind of stuff. And at first, like I mentioned, I wasn't that high on. Too much going on with the uh, Tennessee Titans here. You, maybe you saw Mariota take a little bit of a step back. Corey Davis didn't have the rookie season that you wanted him to have necessarily. Well, I'm still really high on Corey Davis, but you know, got hurt and just the fantasy football community is quick to if it, if it isn't right now, forget about it. That guy's yeah. terrible. Yeah, all this and that. Um, Rashard Matthews is always trusty and over there, but. You know, I wasn't super excited about this offense and maybe where it's going. But I, again, after I did some some digging here, I started to really like what I'm seeing. So you get Mike Vrabel, the new head coach of this team. Yeah, over in Patriots the Houston guy. Texans, Patriots guy was over in the Texans. We know that defense was a nightmare matchup. Uh, you didn't you didn't want to play the the, the tennis or the uh, Houston Texans uh, defense. Sure, they were a, a tough matchup. So. You got to like that. I, I like what Vrabel's doing. He did, He passed up on the Niners. He said he didn't want to go there, so didn't like him after that. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. We got Shanahan. Oh, it worked out well for you. Well, so it's, the Tennessee Titans bring in Vrabel. I like that. So then they get another huge piece to me, one of my favorite uh, defensive coordinators in the league, the best, in my opinion, may, or maybe top five at least. Uh, Dean Pease retires from the Ravens. Says he's done with football, and then he comes back, and he's just like retiring wasn't for me. Vrabel scoops him up, just a phenomenal pickup for any team, yeah. let alone a guy like Vrabel. Right. Let alone there's some pieces on this defense, yeah. Um, and they they pretty much drafted all defense in the draft, yeah. Surprise, surprise. Um, but what we're really here to chit chat about is the offensive coordinator that they brought in, Matt Lafleur. Yep. Um, he comes over from L.A. The Rams. The Rams. The, um, the the league leading points per game Rams. Yeah, the efficient points per game Rams here. The 2017 version of the 2016 Falcons. Sure. So <laughs> Matt LaFleur is 38 years old. Yep. He started his career as a Texans offensive assistant uh, where him and Kyle Shanahan uh, first became lovers. Yep. In 2008 and 2009. Shanahan goes to Washington, bring, goes with his dad. Yep. Brings along, LaFleur. guess who? His yep. lover, LaFleur. He lets him uh, kind of coach QBs or be in charge of that kind of deal from 2010 to 2013. He leaves for a year, goes to Notre Dame. Obviously, the Shanahan regime exits. Gruden comes in, all that kind of jazz. Next season, Kyle goes to uh, ATL. Guess who he brings in? <laughs> Matt LaFleur. Right. Lets him be his quarterback coach. Matt Ryan has his best year yep. after his second year being in this system. Old McVay and um, LaFleur get together. Golf has a nice uh, season with, with them boys coaching him up. Kyle leaves for San Francisco in this Falcons offense that he brought LaFleur into. They pass over him to be the, the head coach or the offensive coordinator in this system. And old guess who swoops in here? McVay. You get McVay swooping in, who, by the way, was familiar with him, with his time as being at the Redskins. Right. Um, so he swoops in. He knows what he's got in LaFleur. Um, so let me let me just sum, sum that up because there was a bunch of he leaves and he goes here. Basically what Casey just said was for the, for the past 10 years, Matt LaFleur has been rolling around 
with Kyle Shanahan and lately the last couple of years, McVay. Right. So you don't want to be spending time with anybody. But you can't spend time with better offensive right. minds than Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay. And I started this. He's 38. So he's still, 38 now. Still a young guy. He's still a super young and guy. And has, just like you pointed out, has spent some of the, spent the last spent 10 years. Crucial developing time with guys who sought him out. Right. And they were like, oh, I know who the guy is. And then. Kyle left and and McVay swooped right in and he's and let's be honest like the the two guys that we're talking about right now which are two of the top offensive minds in the league in McVay and Kyle Shanahan they're both like thirty eight and forty two right. so like the McVay's whole time even younger right so the whole time exactly McVay's the youngest head coach in history so the whole time they're young with the young Mifflur, if Lafleur as all this is happening there it's just it's a nice little melting pot of offensive genius right so is what it is if you don't like the coaching talk hyperbole and all that kind of stuff again conversation's not for you this podcast probably isn't for you but because you I it. do believe that stuff is really real and sometimes it doesn't pan out sometimes he's not a head coach material or offensive coordinator material or maybe he just doesn't fit in or but I I believe that this guy is is about as ripe for the picking as you're going to get. You're going to bite into this thing and be like a juicy peach <laughs> running down your chin because the peach isn't any good unless the juice runs down your mouth. Right. Well, let me just point this out because you just you just said something. If you don't think this stuff matters, every year when you come out of your draft, there's a, a year later you can look back at the draft board or in midseason or after even week two, and you're like, why did that guy in the seventh round, he took this guy – and nobody was looking at him before the tenth round, or just to throw it back a couple years ago, when when um, the dude from Oregon, Chip Kelly, Kelly Chip Kelly comes to the to the Eagles, everybody had their top ten running backs or whatever, and I, I had the second pick in our draft back in our home league back in the day. I took Shady numbered one or two overall, whichever where I was, and he he was the best running back in the league. And it was just like, you just, you got Chip Kelly. Everything he does runs through the running back. He gets on with the Eagles. There's LaShawn McCoy. I don't care what the 10, the the rankings tell me. I'm going to take McCoy right here because I know about the opportunity right. that's about to happen. And so every year there's things that happens in the NFL that you need to be paying attention to. And if you don't think this is a big deal, just listen to what Casey's saying here and we'll put it all together. And like, maybe it's not a home run, but if you can connect some dots, you can get ahead of the curve and it is about value. And it's definitely about perceived value. And one of the biggest things, if you look at the, if you just buy, if you just get players that people think are bad because they had down season or you get a guy who everybody knows is great, but it didn't go good for 12 months, and now the day... People if, have terrible if, memories, you can and they're swoop just ready to get here, rid of them and pick up Todd Gurley and win your league. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. You just got to have faith in what you say and what you know. That's that's the best example. Sometimes it doesn't always work out. what just happened with Todd Gurley coming off of his horrible 2016 with the Rams and Jeff Fisher. McVay goes over there. He's the offensive MVP of the league, and he won your fantasy league for you. Literally won it with two 50-point games. So... Getting back to a little bit of the the coaching tree and the talk here, and when I first brought this up to you uh, about kind of just searching around, and I didn't know that the, obviously that these guys had these. With, he was hanging out with Shanahan and McVeigh, and was boys with all them, and kind of learning their systems. Um, you were like, well, I mean, he was the offensive coordinator in the Rams, and now he's the offensive coordinator. Why would you make this kind of lateral move? Yeah, well, here? that's when you brought this conversation up to me. I said, who oh, cares? I, right. I, well, I remembered. Hearing somebody say on the radio, maybe I was listening to Mike and Mike or something driving around in the morning, and somebody said, okay, the offensive coordinator moves from the Rams to the Titans, and why would you make that lateral move? And I remembered hearing that, and I remembered hearing LaFleur's name, and he went from the Rams to the Titans, and he changed from offensive coordinator to offensive coordinator, and the guy on the radio, I can't remember who it, said, who it was, literally said, that's a lateral move, why would you do that? And I just heard it, and it stuck in my mind, but I didn't look into it. Casey calls me with this information here and we start talking and after it all breaks out and Casey gives me all this information he dug up, it's obvious why he did it because you're not going to be the offense, you're not going to be the coach of the Rams anytime soon because McVay is the is the is right. the godfather over there. McVay's going nowhere. You make you got a, no chance to move. It's up. a quote unquote lateral move, but you give yourself a, a higher ceiling when you right. go to the Titans. Plus, you were not in control of anything with exactly. Sean McVay being your head coach Which, or Kyle Shanahan really necessarily being your head coach. You get you're in the meeting rooms and you get you they at they clearly 
trust you. They and respect asking, your opinion. Right. They respect but everything the about the day, you. It's but their show. It's their show. So now you get total autonomy of an offense, and you, you get to make Matt LaFleur's name right. now a household name. Exactly. Not just being well, McVay's, McVay's guy boy, or yep. Shanahan's guy. Now That's you it. get your chance. That's it. And I'm... I'm buying in because this is what these are the kind of things that I buy into. This is where you can find value. It doesn't always work out, but you got a guy coming in here who like the the press conference when you watch it when he came in here to to talk about what they're going to do with Tennessee was just so good. He's talking about how it's just extremely difficult to dink and dunk down the field. Defenses are just too good. If you look at it statistically, uh, teams that are uh, getting the, the the big chunk plays, the explosive plays, are teams that are producing more yards and more points. Right. He made it crystal clear what he wants out of his offense. He wants to go for big plays. Right. Ultimately, yards don't matter. You have to score enough points to win. Obviously, fortunately, in his career, he's been with good play callers. Started with Gary Kubiak, which also another strong play caller. Right. Kyle Shanahan and Sean McVay. Um, so now his whole thing was basically like all about creating explosive plays and being efficient. Well, that's what Kyle Shanahan does best. That's what Sean McVay does best. That's why these offense function at a high level and, year in, year out. And those were direct quotes. That was verbatim. Casey was reading from you the press conference, and he goes, that was always at the forefront of our minds when he's talking about McVay and Kyle Shanahan and Gary Kubiak. That was the things in their plans, in their meetings. That's what they practiced was big, explosive plays. How can we create explosive plays? And that's what he said when, verbatim. When you listen to guys who were in these systems talk about these systems, there's a lot of verbiage and all this other stuff in, in a lot of playbooks. And, and you're doing all these things. And a lot of these guys, like I've, I've seen several people say it who have been in these systems and been in other systems. And they're saying, like, you, you, there's all this other verbiage and you're doing all these other things out on the field in these other playbooks and you, you don't even really know why. But once these, once these, once Shanahan and McVay explain things to you, you see exactly why you're doing what you're doing and why the verbiage is the way it is because it, it's creating. It makes sense. That's what they said out of the Falcons a couple years ago when Shanahan got in there. That's what some of those play. I remember seeing an interview with Matt Ryan. That's exactly what he said. He goes, "This, the what we're doing on offense, everything is complementary." Right. And and the play action. It's working for the remember next that. One. Remember that 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 story that came out about Matt Ryan working on his bootlegs. Right. And he was like, I've never worked on my bootlegs before. And then the next year he had, a, he was an MVP. Right. That was what he did. He worked on his bootlegs. And right. that, you know, you don't never think you'd never think about a pocket passer working on his bootleg, but just having that bootleg action, just having that play action. Who right. Some people don't think play action even matters. And when you have that play action, you stress the defense and you boot to the right and you throw it to the left or you got that drag. Got to be many, able to throw all the in move 20, in these offenses. In 2016, how many times did you see Julio Jones come across the field, catch a drag? drag route and be wide open right and you're like how is a defense letting go of julio jones it's the scheme they set you up for that they That's set why. you up Love it. um so what what happens here is you, you had this old regime with the exotic smash mouth and malarkey basically trying to you know kind of pound his hands and say this is what we're gonna do yep. and we're gonna we're, we're not gonna tailor any of our schemes to the players that we have and the one of the first things that LaFleur comes in and says is what we're going to do is we're going to my system is going to work around the players that I have available to me and I'm going to tailor it to what best suits their abilities. Right. And what the problem is, is like I was down on Mariota, like I said, but now right now, I, if, if especially super flex leagues, like yeah. I mean, one quarterback leagues, I'm just not a quarterback guy. But once you get into Preach. the super flex, like I think Mariota is about to have a fantastic year. You saw him be very efficient the first year in the exotic smash mouth and, and not turn it over in the red zone and be one of the best red zone quarterbacks. Well, I think you're going to just see him be very efficient and he's going to tailor everything to Mariota's strengths here. And it's not going to be this slow paced prehistoric offense. You're about to see a very creative scheme forward, just getting yeah. what he needs to yeah. be done out of these players. Well, let me say this real quick. This, the, when Kyle Shanahan took over the Falcons, their MVP, best offense in the, in the league thing, it didn't happen until year two, right? It's so what we're talking about may not be something that you see explode onto the scene week one like McVay, McVay's Rams did last year. But what's great here is LaFleur was there 
with McVay. He was there with Kyle Shanahan, did it with the Falcons, and he was there to see it firsthand last year. He was he there took, with RG3 he took when, the he was the, when he was the rookie of the year. And that's a good point all that to, stuff. to bring and, that and around. He, with, he brought uh, Kirk with Cousins, Mariota's right. ability, but he was there to see the Rams take one of the ugliest offenses in the league lat, the two from two years ago and turn it into the highest points per game in 2017. And he had just left the highest points per game in an offense in 2016 right. from the Falcons. So this might not be something that jumps off the screen week one, but I can guarantee you that what LaFleur is going to do with this Titans offense is going to be light years ahead of what these boys were trying to run out there last year. Oh, I don't even think that's a question. And you have a quarterback in Mariota where he, You've just been spinning your wheels and not playing to his strengths. I just can't wait to see what happens when you get a guy like Mariota playing to his strengths and you get a Corey Davis it, it schemed up well and you get a Delaney Walker schemed up well. Oh, yeah. And then to not even come in here and talk about like this offensive line to get back to what the main point of this whole thing is, is that this offensive line, it hasn't changed. Like they took a little bit of a step back last year. They weren't as great as they were that first year. Well, the whole offense took a step right. back. Right. Well, exactly. No, you're not going to get rated highly on the offensive line if your whole offense takes a huge step back. But you still have Taylor Lewan. You still have Quentin Spain. You still have Ben Jones. You still have Josh Klein. And you still have Josh, uh, Jack, Jack Conklin. Conklin. These guys are some of the best. This was coming into last year. This was the best offense. They, yep. they threw the Cowboys to the side. This was the best offensive line yep. uh, in the league. And uh, maybe it's not the best offensive line in the league. Maybe that's kind of come to the forefront a little bit, but they are one of the better units in the league. And now these boys have been together for a while. And now you're about to get a guy who is just been around the scheme masters who just turned this league on its head. <laughs> scheme they masters. really did. They just turned the league on its head everywhere. These guys have went. Their offenses have been great. The 49ers came in. He gets a old, old Shanahan gets a quarterback in the last couple games Five of the and season. Oh. And then boys whip everybody's ass. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, it's, you can you can hate the co the coach speak and and the the hyperbole and all that all that if you want, but I, in my opinion, it's as real as it gets. And if you don't think a coach matters, look at what happened with the 49ers, Just to get off on a real tangent here, they started off they couldn't win a game last year, but they were close and every, they lost a couple in overtime. They lost a couple in the fourth quarter, and each and every week you got a new coach, a young coach. He was obviously proven from the Falcons, but a team that had been seen themselves lo lose the Pat Willis's of the world and just the most stacked up roster ever a couple of years ago to come down to basically zero. And Kyle Shanahan comes in there and signs guys like use check. And just people are just talking crap about why you sign a fullback and why do you do that? Why do you pay a fullback good money? And this, all this kind of stuff. And he's playing around with, uh, Garcon and Goodwin and yeah, Garcon's guys hurt. Who, and who yeah. was the quarterback he started with last year? Hoyer and then Bathard starts with Hoyer, goes to the barely drafted Bathard, and at the end of the year he brings they they make an awesome trade and brings in Jimmy G. Thank you, New England. Thank you, New England. They come up and they go five and zero to end the year. They're never were their heads held low. They they stayed on the course. They finished the year super strong, and now they got just they got the momentum, and it's just they got Jimmy G, and that's all you need. Yeah, because you got you got you win it, you win a couple games, and you bring in Jimmy G, and your whole franchise is turned right. around. So to bring it back to the running back perspective of these of of the Tennessee Titans here, and why I think I'm going out and trying to target uh, Derrick Henry if I can on a, maybe on an owner who drafted him last year and is maybe a little down on him is because of just what we were just talking about. All that good scheme, all that good offense. And then when you look at the running backs for any of those teams, Devontae Freeman and Tevin Coleman were extremely efficient. Todd Gurley was extremely efficient. Like, obviously, these are high-named. And Carlos Hyde was just fantastic for the 49ers last year. Killed it. Obviously, these are really good high-end players, but so is Derrick Henry, or supposedly he's supposed to be. When you look at the, the elusive rating of last year, Derrick Henry's number nine on this chart. He's a huge man. Yeah. Um, and then you bring in Dion Lewis, who is a Patriots guy and old Vrabel is like, Oh, I'll, I'll bring that guy in here. There isn't a better, uh, uh, not, not much of a better, uh, a pass blocker than Dion Lewis. There isn't a better, uh, elusive rating than, than Dion Lewis has. There isn't like, these are two good players who I think are about to get gift wrapped, a really strong system with good players all around them and a great offensive line. So I think that, Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis are about to have a really nice season together. I think they're both going to be extremely usable. Yeah, and 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 the 
to piggyback onto that, I mentioned earlier that Derrick Henry's ADP last year had him at RB. This year was RB17 coming off the board at ADP38. Last year he was RB14, so there was a handful of RBs in front of him, but it was at, at coming off at at um at 30, no, 36 or something like that. So the thing about it is is like you mentioned last year his elusive rating was up there and some of the some of those nice stats, the the ratings that you like to see that don't necessarily have to come off in fantasy points because if you look at if you pull up like the stats for the running backs last year, Derrick Henry was atrocious he, as far as fantasy points right, scored. Right. He Derrick Henry averaged less points per game than Isaiah Crowell, less points per game than Amir Abdullah, less points per game than John, Jonathan Stewart, who was almost no, he was point eight points per game better than Jonathan Stewart, who was dropped in every right. league. You know, so the people right. who like you just the people went, who live in those one year bubbles of just yes. something bad happened and all the the the, the, the uh the sky is always falling on this guy who didn't play well. He must suck. He's not any good. The sky One, fell. Right. The sky fell on Derrick Henry last year, and it fell so hard. Like, just to average eight points a game after you draft, to get a guy that you drafted in that, that Amir Abdullah, Derrick Henry range last year just was just a heartbreaker. Like, D- Amir Abdullah's on a lot of benches in a short bench. I mean, he's on a lot of waiver wires in, in the leagues this year. Derrick Henry's obviously not on any waiver wires, but if you don't think people – their feelings are hurt about Derrick Henry. Just go kick the tires and ask him. Right. And, I mean, when you start looking at the PFF signature stats and you look at uh, elusive ratings and efficiency and all that kind of stuff and breakaway percentage, uh, Derrick Henry's at 14 down here at, at with 36%. Uh, he yeah, just didn't get the touches. Right. He just didn't get a ton of touches. And then what, you know, you had I obviously had in that playoff game where he caught that screen pass and went 70 yards. Right. And it's just... Maybe that sticks in somebody's head, and or maybe that was week seventeen because he in week seventeen he caught a pass and went sixty six yards for maybe a maybe that was week seventeen. But other than I mean, like he his fantasy points last year looked like they were two fifteen seven point seven point nine twenty two four eleven five three nine seventeen eight four four nineteen at the end of the year with one uh, a catch that went sixty six for a touch. So it really couldn't have gotten any worse for Derrick Henry. And I'm not saying you're gonna be able to get him for free. I'm not gonna say I'm not telling you that you're gonna go find him on any waiver wires or anything stupid like no. that. But the point is people paid up and paid up dearly for Derrick Henry sure. last year. And and I think that there the timing is right to strike. You got and and just what you said in all of these Ratings. Dion Lewis right. is super well, is super solid. When you when you go to the PFF signature stat of elusive rating and you sort by twenty five percent because Dion Lewis and Derrick Henry both weren't on the field a, a, a ton yeah. to, to rank in those other percentages. But when you sort by twenty five percent, it's just Alvin Kamara, it's Kenyon Drake, it's Dion Lewis at three with an elusive rating rank third. Um, and then you scroll down to nine, and there's Derrick Henry. Yeah. So these were guys who were pretty elusive with what they were doing, and and this I think. The offense is only going to get better. Yeah. Well, and the thing about uh, maybe it is, n- maybe not for Deion Lewis because he was obviously on the Patriots. But well, and that my my thing is, is I think is, it could be moderately on the same plane. The 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 problem that I have with what we're doing here is that I'm really confused about what I'm going to see out of Deion Lewis outside of the Patriots. But again, wrap it all back with what we talked about with Lafleur being all up in those you know offensive genius type scenarios. Deion Lewis last year, the second half of the season between the offensive injuries that the Patriots have and maybe the Patriots were just like, this is our best running back we got. Burkhead got hurt, and I don't know if that would have even mattered. Just took a head away from the table. They stopped even playing Mike Gillisley. My man was just averaging double-digit carries, crushing it in the last couple games of the season, you know, catching five or six balls a game, getting catching, receiving touchdowns, Carrying it 24 times for a buck 30 against the Bills, who were a decent defense, a playoff team, getting t- two touchdowns against them, 26 for 93 and a touch, and six catches for 40 and a touch against the Jets. Just sick week 16 and 17 goes off with 30 something point PPR games. So, and we saw him a couple years ago before he got hurt in New England, just absolutely tearing it up. And so we've seen Deion Lewis be really, really good. And I, I, I don't know if the, if I'm going to say that the, maybe because of the lack of I, – I know that Rashard Matthews is super solid and everybody wanted to talk about how good Taewon Taylor was going to be last year. And I, do, I too, am like you. I'm still really high on Corey Davis. Maybe 
Deion Lewis is enough of a chess piece and they're going to do and, – and Derrick Henry still gets enough touches where they both just can be awesome in a good offensive situation. And, and But – I would. I'm leaning towards taking advantage of Deion Lewis's presence for the Derrick Henry owner, sending him a low ball offer and being like, Deion Lewis is much better than Derrick Henry last year. Blah blah blah. Play up on the Deion Lewis stuff and see how cheap you can get Derrick Henry, and or go get Deion Lewis very very cheap because, like you said, when the, when an offensive when an offense is scoring points, I mean, obviously Derrick Henry he had 11 catches last year. They're not leaning on him to catch the ball. He's not, and that was one of the things we were talking about, Derrick Henry, last year is how much the coaching staff must have been down on him because even when DeMarco Murray was hurt, they kept running DeMarco Murray out there. Maybe we even said that. Maybe Derrick Henry wasn't picking up some plays, couldn't get in there, couldn't play yeah. any third downs, couldn't get any pass opportunities, got zero, hardly any targets all year long. Most he caught was two balls in one game. Maybe Deion Lewis comes in there and represents that third down back but you know, potentially with a good creative system, maybe both of these guys can crush it for the Titans next year. And I, so I'm I, I a little so. torn about which way I'm going on who's going to be the best, but maybe they can just be both be really, really good. I think I I think that you're going to see a nice balance of of of, of a little uh, thunder Henry, lightning of Henry and Lewis. I think he's going to make I think he's going to make the best usage of these guys' skills. And and you're going to see nice work out of both of these guys, and maybe it is a you know Henry is more of a first and second, and, and Lewis is a third down guy, um, but but that's okay to me. And and, and there it's very unclear who are the guys outside of exactly. Corey Davis, exactly. Rashard Matthews, and Delaney, uh, Walker. and Delaney Walker. Obviously, John who's there, and we know that guys coming out of these out of Shanahan system at least like the like the twelve personnel sure. with maybe a little double tight end action. But we also know that both of those systems. Had guys, whether it was elite, you know, obviously Carlos Hyde, we know he can catch, and we know Devontae Freeman can catch, but like you, there's no reason that you can't play action, boot, and then throw it to Derrick Henry on the other side of the formation and let him run, you know, 60 yards yeah. and be hard to tackle. I mean, that's it was a kind, it was a broken play that happened last year. It was well, it, was, it actually was a well set up scheme, I, a screen. I call it a broken play on the defensive part because the, the Titans just caught the Jaguars sleeping yeah. and threw it to Derrick Henry in a screen play scenario where he was wide open and he just blew it up down the field. But that's my point: is don't you know that Lafleur saw that and was like, if I can catch, there's no reason for Le, Deion Lewis to be the only running back today scheme to get in space, right? Like. And that's the biggest thing too is like you don't you got you got a space back in Deion Lewis, but you, when you're not ex, you're not expecting the space to get to throw. Why would you throw it to Derrick Henry in space? Because look what he does with it. You, when you as soon as you're not expecting it is when it happens for a McVay and a Kyle Shanahan type player, you know, or type play and type scheme. Like sure. that's the reason that Deion Lewis is so good and and for the Patriots and it's may, not to take anything away from Deion Lewis, but I've said this before. The Patriots, there's nobody been better in the last 15 years of getting you leaning left before they're going right. Right. If you think they're going right, they're going left. If yeah. you think they're passing it, they're running it. They keep you off balance. This is a little bit of the complete opposite of what we just talked about with Christian McCaffrey there. I think there's going to be plenty of opportunities for Deion Lewis to catch balls and plenty of opportunities for Derrick Henry to do what he needs to do. And it's going to be because the complete opposite the other of what the Titans are. did last year. Just right. like the Rams and McVay and LaFleur as the offensive coordinator who wasn't calling the plays under McVay, and that's why he left to go get more upside in a position. There's going to be a lot more opportunity for Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis in this offense than anything the Titans flew out, ran out on the field last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we've uh, extinguished our LaFleur flame here for now. Uh, That's a good flame. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully you were interested in, in hearing about where he's been and what he's done. It's something that I'm always really interested in. And I think, you know, there's there's value to be had in, in those kind of discussions and, and figuring out, you know, schemes and, and who runs what and, and where. And I'm I, like I said, I came into this not really loving the Titans offensive situation. I came out of this really loving anybody I could get my hands on the, in the Titans uh, situation here. So. You good? You got anything else? No, I like it. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up today's show. Um, obviously, we were Jay Wayne list today, so that's always a bummer. So if the audio quality wasn't quite as good, it's because we don't have our first round draft pick. He's definitely worth the ADP. Big drop off. Yeah, guys. And I hope you had a good time. I know Casey and I did. We certainly did miss Jay Wayne tonight. And uh, if you guys get a second, if you haven't already done it, we really would appreciate it. If you get a second to go out and leave us a just 
hit the five star review for us on iTunes or any of the other uh, platforms there, but especially the iTunes that that helps us a lot. Um, and it really yeah. does. You can't even fathom how much that helps us out. The the fifteen seconds that it would take you to do that means a lot. We've we've climbed up there. We got a lot more than we ever thought we would get. I think we're rough. You know, 150 or so five star reviews, which is absolutely about 149 more than I thought we'd <laughs> ever get. So if you if you haven't done it for us, man, please just go, man or woman, just please go out there and just tap that for us and and leave us. A, if you don't, you don't even have a type of review, but if you wouldn't mind saying these guys aren't all terrible, that wouldn't be all wouldn't be terrible either. So we appreciate it. You've been listening to the FF Dynasties, married to the game.